Hello and welcome to this virtual symposium for the 20th World Congress of Psychophysiology. So today we'll speak about the psychophysiology of efforts and we'll discuss recent advances in cardiovascular reactivity research. Um, so for the speakers, uh, we'll have Michael Richter, who will talk about autonomic correlates of listening efforts. I will talk about uh, some research on the impact of pain on effort. Then we have Guido Gendela. I will present some work on task choice and how it moderates affective influences on effort rated cardiovascular reactivity. And finally, uh, we'll have Christopher Blinsky uh, presenting research on the impact of fatigue on impulse control. So I would like to thank the speakers for presenting today. And uh, so we'll have individual uh, recording of each presentation. And then at the end, of course, we will be ready to answer to your questions. So thanks again for attending and looking forward for your questions afterward. Hi, my name is uh, Mike Richter. I work at Liverpool John Moss University in the UK. And I'd like to share with you today three studies on cardiovascular correlates of listening effort. Effort refers in general to the allocation of energetic resources to overcome obstacles in goal pursuit. And in the context of listening effort, that refers to any investment of energy or resources to understand auditive signals in general or particular speech signals. There is, uh, I would say for 15 years now or 20 years now, there is a strong interest uh, from audiologists, uh, from hearing scientists to examine physiological correlates of listening effort. And the main reason for that is that hearing impaired individuals often complain about effort for listening. So when you develop a hearing impairment, then it's not only the case that you struggle with understanding speech, it also becomes more effortful, more demanding, more exhausting for you to understand the speech. And interestingly, even if uh, you as a hearing impaired individual, if you have a fitted hearing aid, that it's still not unlikely that you still will feel that it's really effortful because many hearing aids, they are really good in restoring the the hearing performance, so they help you really well to understand speech, but still they often lead to the subjective feeling that using the hearing aid to understand speech is really effortful. So the idea or the hope of audiologists is to use physiological indicators of listening effort in the hearing aid fitting process to develop hearing aids, which are not only good in um, allowing the individual to understand speech, but also in reducing the subjective or the effort that is required to understand speech when using the hearing aid. In the literature, um, hearing signs, there are many physiological measures that have been used from skin conductance to um, FNRs to um, RSA to EEG parameters, but there is no unifying framework, not for the physiological measures, though there's no physiological theorizing often underlying the choice of measures. And there's also often no psychological theory that drives the, the paradigms um, of researchers in audiology. And what I would like to do today is I would like to show you a psychological theory that is a useful framework for studying listening effort. And I was also like to elaborate briefly on a physio physiological theorizing on uh, studying listening effort. And uh, the psychological theory that I would like to present to you is a general theory on effort. It's called motivation intensity theory. And the theory assumes that we try to avoid wasting our resources because they might be important for our survival at a later point in time. So we aim always to minimize the waste of resources. 
and only to invest what is required. And then as a consequence of this basic assumption of the theory, the theory predicts that task demand should directly determine your effort. So if you know that you can succeed, that you can do the task, and if you know that it's worthwhile to invest the required effort, then you should do exactly what is required and not more. Task demand should guide your effort investment. However, obviously this is only possible if you have an idea about what is required. And if you feel that you can't do it, or if you feel that the potential benefits are not worth the required effort, that you should disengage and not invest any effort in the task. A graphical representation of these predictions looks like this. So we have on the x-axis the difficulty, the demand level of the task, we have on the y-axis the amount of effort that is invested, and we have on the left side a situation where it's not important for the individual to understand, for instance, speech in a noisy situation, and on the right side, we have a situation where it's really important for the individual to understand the speech. What you can see is that the main difference in the predictions, these orange lines, is the range over which a proportional relationship between task demand and effort is predicted. So if it's not really important to understand the speech in noise, then your effort should only increase across a relatively low a range of difficulty levels, and then you should relatively soon give up and no longer invest any effort. On the right side, if it's really important for you to understand the speech and noise, then you should be willing, even for really difficult tasks, to invest the effort, and correspondingly, across a broad range of difficulty levels, from very easy to very difficult, you should see this increase, this proportional relationship between the difficulty of the task and the effort that is invested. Motivation intensity theory makes a, a second set of predictions for situations where you have absolutely no idea about how difficult the task is. And in these situations of unclear task difficulty, the importance of understanding the speech in noise or of just in general uh, attaining your goal should directly drive your effort investment. So the more important it is for you to successfully complete the task, the more effort you should invest. This is the psychological theory, and this psychological theory has been frequently tested using cardiovascular correlates of effort, and almost exclusively, these studies have focused on sympathetic activity on the heart, and that's driven by observations by Obrist and, and Wright, who concluded that task engagement or effort is associated with uh, sympathetic impact on the heart. And we would like to extend in these uh, studies, in our studies on listening effort, this perspective a little bit, because if you look at physical exercises, at physical effort, then you can see that both branches of the autonomic nervous system play a role. If you look in particular at heart rate changes, at low exercise levels, so at low levels of physical effort, these increases in heart rate are mainly driven by the parasympathetic system. Uh, only at moderate levels of exercise intensity, the sympathetic system kicks in and at the, the high end, when the parasympathetic withdrawal is almost complete, then you mainly have uh, these changes in heart rate being driven by changes in sympathetic activity. That's a graphical representation of this. And that's basically our physiological uh, rationale, our physiological prediction for assessing sympathetic and parasympathetic correlates of listening effort. Our assumption or prediction would be that if the effort is low on the left side in this graph here, we would mainly expect to see um, increases in effort to be paralleled by decreases in parasympathetic activity, and the not a lot of changes in sympathetic activity. And at the higher end, so if there's a lot of listening effort invested, then we would expect to not to see many changes in parasympathetic activity because the withdrawal should be almost complete, but huge changes in sympathetic activity. 
and to assess sympathetic and parasympathetic activity in our studies, we've used an impedance cardiograph, which used this uh, configuration of electrodes here, and gave us basically two measures, pre-ejection period and uh, indicator of sympathetic activity on the heart. Pre-ejection period refers to the time interval between the beginning of the electric activation, stimulation of the left ventricle, and the opening of the aortic valve. This interval gets shorter, the more forcefully your heart contracts, and then and the higher the sympathetic activity on the heart is. And we have uh, RSA as an indicator of parasympathetic nervous system activity on the heart. So the change in heart rate that is synchronized with changes in respiration. And what you would expect is basically where as the, sympath as the parasympathetic activity decreases, you would also ex expect uh, RSA to decrease. In the studies we have, in two studies, the second and third study, we've measured both uh, branches. In this first study, we've exclusively focused on sympathetic activity. And uh, this study, we've manipulated, you know, within person's design, task difficulty across two levels and reward across two levels. And what participants had to do in this uh, task is they basically had to listen to two tones that we presented to them. So there was a first tone followed by a second one. And in 50% of the trials, these tones were exactly the same. In the other 50% of the trials, they were different. Participants then had to decide whether these tones actually were the same or not. And we gave them feedback on their response. And to manipulate the difficulty in the trials where the tones were different, the difference between the trolls were either 3 hertz, which makes it a really difficult task, or 20 hertz, which makes it an easy task. And then to manipulate the reward, we told participants that they could earn either two Swiss francs or only um, 0 0.20 Swiss francs for having at least 90% of the trials correct. They, as I said before, it was within design, so they performed all four possible combinations of the tasks um, in four different blocks. And before each block, we had a baseline period and our change scores. That's what I'm going to present you uh, in the results are the difference between the cardiovascular activity during the performance of the task and the activity during the rest periods. And this is uh, sympathetic activity. So the more negative the change here for PEP is, the stronger the sympathetic activity, the higher the listening effort. And as you can see, it's exactly as motivation intensity theory would predict. So we don't see a difference as a function of the two reward levels, so the golden bar and the blue bar here on the left side when the task is easy. When the task is easy, effort should be justified under both conditions and individuals should just invest a low amount of effort because it's easy but not differ as a function of reward. If the task is difficult, you would expect on, on the right side of the bars, you would expect participants in the high reward condition to consider their effort to be justified. And they should invest effort. They should have a high sympathetic activity. That's what you can see here. The change score is very negative in the blue for the blue bar. But if the reward is low, the orange bar, they should consider the required effort not to be justified and they should disengage. And as you can see, that's um, congruent with our prediction here, the data. There's no difference between the activity, the sympathetic activity during the task and between the activity during the baseline in this low reward, high difficult condition. So first study that shows that effortful listening is associated with sympathetic activity. And here's a second study in which we then added uh, a measure of parasympathetic activity, and we only manipulated task difficulty here. We had three possible difficulty levels, low, moderate, to high, and one impossible level. Again, it was a within design, and we changed the type of task also. So what we used here is we use a speech and noise task in which in each trial, 
we presented one 30 second story, uh, a spoken story embedded in background white noise. And after the 30 seconds, participants were asked a question about the content of the story to check their understanding and to make sure that they paid attention to the content. And the, to manipulate the difficulty, we manipulated the amount of white noise that we added to the speech signal. So in the impossible condition, there was so much white noise that it was impossible to understand the speech. In the low condition, there was just a really low amount of white noise, so it was really easy to understand the speech and to follow the story. We had the same kind of paradigm. We had a baseline followed by a block of the speech and noise task, and we measured cardiovascular activity, PP, and RSA in particular to get our change scores and to examine changes in sympathetic and parasympathetic activity associated with listening effort. These are the results for sympathetic activity. What you can see is uh, for the three possible difficult conditions, you see a decrease in PP activity, in, in, in PP, so an increase in sympathetic activity uh, as a function of task demand. And in the impossible condition, you see an evidence for disengagement, no change in sympathetic activity compared to the rest period. And here on the right side, we have our uh, RSA scores. And uh, well, what you can see is that in, in the impossible condition, the scores were not different from the baseline. So again, here, evidence for disengagement. But um, what you can see is that the thing that is missing here a little bit is we don't see the expected strong decrease in parasympathetic activity at the low difficulty condition. That is what our prediction, that's the graph in the middle of the slide here, would actually have expected. We would have expected at the low effort intensity that we already see a strong decrease in parasympathetic activity and no change in sympathetic activity. And that is basically the bit that is missing here. Um, so we see no change in sympathetic activity for the low condition, but also no change in parasympathetic activity. It's congruent with our predictions to see the strong parasympathetic withdrawal in the moderate and high condition. So evidence for sympathetic activity, mixed evidence for our parasympathetic uh, related prediction. The third study that I'd like to present to you is a study that has examined the impact of reward. The design was quite similar to the preceding study. Just this time, we used an unclear difficulty task where reward should directly determine the effort that you invest and we manipulated reward across four levels. And uh, the paradigm, the task was exactly the same as in the preceding one. So what we would expect here is basically to see a direct increase in the effort that is invested as a function of reward level. And uh, well, as you can see for sympathetic activity, that works quite nicely. Um, sympathetic activity increased as a function of reward. Uh, for parasympathetic activity, it didn't work at all. So we just had a general decrease, but wasn't uh, moderated by reward level. Taking everything together, I uh, would conclude that in all three studies, there was evidence that effortful listening is associated with sympathetic activity changes. But the evidence for the parasympathetic nervous system activity was uh, less consistent. Um, in the two studies in which we examined it, in, in one we found mixed evidence, in the other one we didn't find evidence at all. So what do we now do with our uh, physiological rationale? Um, I would say it's, uh, it looks good as far as it concerns sympathetic activity. But we already knew that before from all the research that had been done with cardiovascular measures on motivation and intensity theory. The question is, what do we do with this parasympathetic activity idea? I would say it's a little bit too early to, for a final conclusion because in our studies, we did not have the most sophisticated design for assessing RSA. We assessed and controlled for respiration frequency for instance, we didn't control for tidal volume. and We also didn't use one of the more sophisticated, elaborated methods that exist 
for assessing RSA. So I think there's still room to um, conduct research on this prediction and to, to test whether the parasympathetic nervous system activity is involved in listening effort. Thank you for watching this uh, video. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask me, please feel free to contact me at m.richter at lgmu.ac.uk. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hi. So I will present you today a study on the impact of task difficulty and pain on cognitive efforts, and more specifically to see how task difficulty could moderate the impact of pain on cognitive efforts. So to start, um, it's important to consider that chronic pain, which is pain that lasts more than three to six months, has a considerable human and economic burden. So people that suffer from chronic pain has really a lot of a poor quality of life and difficulties in, um, in working and etc. So it's really an important topic. And one thing considering chronic pain is that it is often associated with feeling of fatigue and behavioral disengagement. It means that people with chronic pain usually stop doing uh, different things, either in daily life or also during work. And um, this is yes, quite a problem for, for them. And one idea that came with this uh, observation is that somehow pain could be related to uh, cognitive effort, who has, could have an impact on cognitive effort. And this is what we more specifically tested in the present study, the present research. Uh, so there has not been any experimental studies on this topic until now. And so uh, we started this line of research and more specifically, we, we assessed effort as cardiovascular activity as an objective me uh, measure of effort. So let's start with some theoretical uh, considerations. So pain can be defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So that means that pain is always related to the body somehow, um, but it's so important to consider that pain is, uh, is a, considered as a psychological state. That means that it's a subjective state, it's um, an affective state, and in that sense, it's not only related to a physiological mechanism, but it includes some psychological processes. And in that sense, it has been shown that pain is modulated by cognitive and emotional factors. And um, this is also supported by, um, if we look more specifically at the interaction between pain and cognitive control, first we can see that there are quite um, strong overlapping brain regions between these two uh, phenomena. Uh, first, there is the anterior mid cingulate cortex, as you can see here in this uh, meta-analysis of Schachmann and collaborator. And as you can see, you can find some pretty similar activation if people are confronted with pain or if they are working on a cognitive control task. And there is also some overlapping uh, regions in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and in the insula. And overall, there are also other evidence showing that pain and cognitive control share common and limited cognitive resources, such as attention and working memory. And this is supported by uh, evidence showing bidirectional interactions between pain and cognitive control. Uh, for instance, it is well known that cognitive distraction reduces pain. And here the idea is that uh, uh, if you are uh, working on a cognitive task, then you have less resources to, to uh, or, or you, you treat less the signal related to pain, and then pain is reduced. That's a typical distraction effect. And also there is the other um, effect that pain impairs cognitive performance during demanding tasks. That means that if you're working on a demanding task and you have pain at the same time, usually the performance are lower because Again, it uh, requires similar uh, cognitive resources. And finally, uh, there is also more broadly this idea that pain impairs self-regulation. That means that people with pain are less able to regulate their emotion 
or the behavior. And that, then there's the question, so how does it relate to uh, effort? And if we look more specifically to this relationship between cognitive control and effort, so broadly, cognitive processes can be arranged from in a continuum from automatic to control processes. And usually control processes is associated with effort. And uh, so automatic process is just direct response to the environment. And if you have to engage some resources um, in, during control processes, usually this is associated with effort. And by definition, control processes are associated with effort. And just to give a definition of effort um, provided by Professor Gandela and Rex Wright, Professor Wright, uh, so effort can be defined as the amount of resources people mobilize to execute instrumental behavior. So this is a broad definition that which concerns physical or cognitive effort, but it works well also with cognitive control, which is like cognitive resources required to uh, for controlled processes. And so effort is associated with cognitive performance, but more generally with self-regulation, so, so like emotional regulation or behavioral regulation. And the question is how it works also with pain. And, but before that, let's start with a, a theory that allows to uh, make some predictions regarding efforts. And this theory mainly uh, relies on uh, two de main determinants main determinants of effort. The first one is task difficulty, and the other one is success importance. And the idea here is that when task difficulty is fixed and known, effort is mobilized proportionally to subjective difficulty as long as success is possible and effort is justified. And we can see this prediction in this uh, figure. Uh, and so the idea is that if the task is easy, people engage in low effort. If the task is more difficult, they engage more effort. And if the task becomes too difficult or if the required effort is not justified, so if it exceeds success importance, people should disengage. And, uh, and the rationale of this theory is that people aim to conserve their energy. So resource conservation principle. So they will not invest more than necessary to execute a given behavior. And it's only when task difficulty is unfixed or unknown. So if people have no idea about task difficulty, uh, then in this case, the theory predicts that effort is mobilized proportionally to uh, success importance. But the most important point is that mainly effort is determined by subjective difficulty until a point where uh, uh, the required effort is not more justified by success importance. And the question is how pain comes into play in, in, in with these predictions. And the idea here is that pain can be considered as a negative effect that attracts attention. And actually it's important, <clears throat> it's an important signal, it's a warning signal. So to, um, to signal that uh, some threat can occur to the body or is occurring to the body. And therefore, uh, and, and this signal is, is useful to of course, uh, adjust or adapt your behavior to avoid some uh, burden or, or uh, bodily threat. And therefore, one may expect that if you are working on a, on a cognitive task and you have pain together, this will um, add some demand on executive functioning. So we saw that pain uh, requires uh, similar brain areas, similar cognitive processes such as attention and working memory. So if you have pain together with cognitive performance, this should, uh, uh, has as a consequence, an additional demand on executive function. And so pain is expected to increase subjective difficulty and therefore influence effort according to a motivational and tested theory. Um, so here I will present, I will test this prediction using cardiovascular measures of effort. So based on the ample evidence that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> effort can be assessed as beta adrenergic in sympathetic activity of the heart, which was, uh, initiated uh, by uh, Professor Wright. Um, and so to uh, assess this beta adrenergic sympathetic activity in the heart, one can rely on myocardial contractility and more specifically the pre-ejection period, which is the time interval between the uh, excitation of left ventricular of the left ventricle and the opening of the aortic valve. And this is really uh, uh, the purest measure that we have non-invasive and invasively 
um, for uh, sympathetic activity on the heart. Then you can also use blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, and heart rate and diastolic blood pressure are less sensitive to sympathetic activity, but it can also uh, respond to that. Okay, so we first tested our main hypothesis uh, with a studies uh, investigating the main effect of pain on effort. Uh, this uh, study was already published. And here we had 30 university students and uh, within subject design with four conditions. So either pain alone, the task alone, task with non-painful stimulations and task with painful stimulations. So we wanted to compare um, what happened if you're working on a conscious class together with pain with some uh, relevant control conditions. And uh, for pain, we use thermal stimulations on the leg with a thermo that you can see here on the, on the, on the right. And so this thermo uh, applied uh, or administered uh, painful stimulation ranging from 39, which is not painful, but to up to 48.5 degrees, which is quite painful. And then people worked on an easy memory span task. So first we calibrated the, the stimulations for each participant uh, to have uh, non-painful and painful stimulations. And then people worked in the different conditions um, together with the task or with the pain, uh, or pain alone and task alone. And for the results, uh, we also measured subjective difficulty and we could find an increase in subjective difficulty uh, in this task pain condition compared to the three others, which supported our predictions that pain should increase subjective difficulty. Then regarding PEP reactivity, we found an effect uh, with an automatically detect detected PEP, which I'll call here PEP Lozano. Uh, and this was only visible during the first minute of the task. But as you can see here in this figure, uh, so more negative score more negative PEP score indicate more sympathetic activity. And here we had stronger PEP reactivity um, in the task pain condition. And this was then lower in the four, in the three other uh, conditions. And we had a, a significant linear contrast uh, that was predicted. And also this was supported uh, with a systolic blood pressure activity as expected. And here again, we had a nice uh, linear contrast and with the stronger strongest uh, efforts, strongest systolic reactivity in the task pain condition. So this was first evidence, sorry, this was first evidence that to, for main effect of pain on, um, on effort. But of course, we wanted to know if um, this effect could be moderated by task difficulty, really to show that this was not associated only with pain. So, Actually, here we could see that pain alone uh, produced the lowest um, uh, sympathetic reactivity. Uh, but still, to test the predictions of the theory, it was important to try to see how task difficulty could moderate uh, the impact of pain on effort. So that was the aim of the present study that I would like to show you today. So for the method, we had 28 university students. We had to exclude three participants because they reported high pain scores in the warmth condition. So as a final sample, we had 25 participants. So we had a two by two within subject design with two condition of task difficulty, easy or difficult, and two stimulations, pain or non-painful stimulation. Again, we use thermal stimulations on the leg. And for the task, we use an N-back task with either one back versus three back. So in this task, you see individual letter on the screen and you have to say if it's the same that one or three positions uh, before as you can see here um, this is a well-known task to to induce uh, uh, cognitive control and, um, and yeah so we had an easy and a difficult condition so for the reading predictions if you remember uh, what I showed you before uh, regarding the warmth conditions, the control conditions, somehow we have similar prediction that uh, I presented to you before. So uh, low, lower uh, effort in the easy and in difficult condition. And with pain, what we expected is that pain should increase subjective difficulty and therefore the line should go to the left. And as a consequence, this should result in stronger uh, efforts in the easy condition 
compared to the warmth condition. But in the difficult condition here, the idea is that the stronger effort that is required with, with pain would not be justified. Uh, and therefore we would expect more like a disengagement, or at least a reduction of effort in this condition. And so we tested these predictions with an interaction contrast. And also we tested contrast by time interaction to see how, um, how this was changing uh, uh, along the task, or if we only had a main effect uh, for this uh, uh, contrast, for our contrast. So for the results, uh, first we're getting the pain ratings. Um, so we had, uh, of, uh, as a result of successful pain manipulation, we had really stronger pain um, in the pain condition than the warmth condition. Um, and that was the most important. We had a slight effect of tendon, the then marginal effect of task difficulty, uh, but just not really important for today. Uh, most important, we had uh, also the expected effect on subjective difficulty. And as you can see here, people reported a slightly stronger difficulty, higher difficulty uh, in the painful condition compared to the warmth condition. So this was also in support of our predictions. Getting pep reactivity, looking at the whole task. So we could not find really what we expected. So actually in the easy condition, we had uh, what we expected. That means stronger effort in the pain that in warmth condition, but in the difficult condition, uh, we did not find any difference between uh, the two conditions. However, we also had a significant contrast by time interaction. And looking at the first minute of the task here, we could have a significant interaction contrast. And as you can see here, in the difficult condition, the effect of pain was somehow moderated by this condition, by the, by the difficult condition. So uh, we don't have a main effect of pain in two conditions, rather in the difficult condition, you have lower uh, effort in the pain than in the warmth condition. So of course, if you look at cell comparisons, we have a significant difference in the easing condition and it's not significant in the difficult condition, but the overall uh, contrast is significant uh, here. So at least this provides some support for our hypothesis. Regarding susceptible pressure, the contrast was not significant. The patent looks like pep proactivity, but it was not significant. Again, for diastolic blood pressure, this was not significant neither. So as a general discussion, um, what you could see at least in, in these two studies that I presented you uh, is that pain systematically increases subjective difficulty and this is an effect that we could find also in other studies that I didn't present you today, but this quite, seems quite to be quite uh, robust. Then we found some support for our hypothesis on the impact of pain on effort-rated cardiovascular activity. So we found the main effect in the first study. And then in the, in the main study, we have this, uh, we, replicate, we replicated this effect in the easy condition. And in the difficult condition, we have this moderation uh, that is supported at least for the first minute of pep activity. So it, of course it's not very strong. So there are some limitations of the findings, but still uh, I would interpret these findings as some evidence for this hypothesis. And of course uh, we expected more disengagement um, in this difficult pain condition. And here it was a, a lab study with healthy and well-paid participants and uh, one explanation of this uh, absence of disengagement is that people were still quite motivated to do the task and therefore they did not disengage as much as we expected. But as we know also from other studies, it's not easy to find disengagement in different uh, kind of study uh, testing different variables of efforts. But uh, yeah, this is maybe something that we can discuss later. But then the point here is to see, okay, should we have stronger effects with chronic pain patients? Because uh, yes, of course, in this lab study, uh, we had, uh, uh, we administered some uh, stimulations 
like five or six stimulations for each condition, but this is quite different than really having to cope with a recurrent pain and uh, as patients with uh, chronic pain have to do. So probably we might expect stronger effects with chronic pain patients, but this is something that has to be tested uh, in further studies. So I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank Tamara Consella who ran the studies and processed the data and also thanks the Swiss National Science Foundation for supporting this line of research. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, the title of the talk is called Task Choice Moderates Effective Influence on Effort-Related Cardiovascular Response. And what I want to do is to present some new research from a new project we have started. Um, and uh, this project deals with a moderator of effective influences, affective, so experience affective influences, on uh, action execution, and especially on effort mobilization assessed as cardiovascular response. And to start my talk, we make a small excursion from psychophysiology to the psychology of the will, volition, and action control. And in that literature, you find that people, uh, researchers agree about the idea that making a decision about a goal or an action, choosing an action, uh, changes people's mindset. Because one pe once people have decided to do something, they uh, will experience commitment or increased commitment to accomplish what they have chosen. And this should lead to, uh, additionally to an action orientation. People become eager and focused on uh, doing the necessary to accomplish what they have decided to do. And, and that is the most important aspect in a phenomenon which is called goal or action shielding. And goal or action shielding is a special mindset that uh, protects action execution action execution is volition from conflicting temptations like alternative goals, wanting to watch TV while I have to study, things like that. And, and that's my topic of today, also incidental effective influences. The idea is that once people have decided to do something, um, they become protected against effective influences, effective stimulation like music, uh, pleasant orders, uh, nice or not so nice people, everything which is surrounding them, and uh, that these effective influences will become filtered or that people become immunized against it. So my favorite example is a penalty during a soccer match when uh, the person who has to shoot is approaching the ball and you will find people who are just very strongly influenced by the atmosphere, by the people uh, wanting to decourage the, the person who has to shoot. And there are other spotters who are just extremely focused, who act like a robot. And this robot-like mode of thinking is what people in the will and volition literature had in mind. That once people have decided to do something, they become easily determined and very focused, and they can filter out potential effective stimulation that may have a negative impact on what they do. Um, however, According to our research, that was research we have done for nearly 30 years now, there is very solid evidence for systematic effective influences on effort mobilization and persistence during action. And these are two central aspects of volition. So people in the volition and will literature, they talk a lot about the mobilization of resources, effort and persistence as two indicators of goal pursuit and the central aspects of volition. Well, so this issue is that we have found repeated uh, and systematic effects of effective influences on action execution, while the action and uh, volition literature suggests that once people have accepted to do something or decided themselves to do something, once they agree to do something, they should not show these effects. And to have a glance on what we have done over the years, uh, most of this research on conscious effective influences on behavior was run in the context of a theory that is called the mood behavior model. And there the idea is that uh, people who experience a sad or happy mood will execute action differently uh, than people uh, in the corresponding mood, which is either positive or negative. And uh, the idea is that uh, moods have an influence on behavior-related judgments. In general, in the social cognition literature, you will be aware of a phenomenon which is called mood congruency. 
in evaluative judgments. People who are happy see the world uh, uh, more optimistically and positively and people who are unhappy, they are more pessimistic. And the idea here is that uh, this is also visible in behavior-related judgments about especially task difficulty. So when people are in a set mood, they will experience relatively high difficulty of a given task, while people who are in a happy mood, they should experience relatively much ease. The result is that the experience difficulty should lead to high effort and the experience ease should lead to relatively low effort as long as success is possible and justified. And well, we will see this in more details in a second. So what is the solution to this riddle? On the one hand, the evolution literature says, okay, when people uh, have decided or agree to do something, they should be protected from effective influences, effective stimulation from the outside. While our research and other research has shown that, well, there's very good evidence that volition, the execution of actions in terms of effort mobilization is systematically influenced by such effective influences. So that's a contradiction. Our simple solution for this riddle is that we think that uh, self-chosen action and assigned action will have different effects on the immunization against effective influences from the outside. So the idea is that when people have self-chosen an action, when they have deliberated, experienced maybe a conflict on about what they want to do, this results in high commitment when they have decided I want to do that. And this high commitment is linked to a strong shielding against incidental effective influences from the outside. So people are very action focused. And that means that in self-chosen action, we expect that effective influences on action should be weak. However, whenever tasks are assigned, assigned action, commitment is there, but it's lower. It's not so high as after uh, self-chosen uh, 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 and, and, and deliberation. And uh, the result is that there's relatively weak shielding and this weaker shielding makes relatively strong effective influences on action possible. The other interesting point is, well, I mean, for this, there's ample evidence. And this is not surprising because in the actual, uh, the nearly always applied uh, experimental paradigm in psychology, we just study assigned action. So people come to the lab and we ask them to do something, they agree. That is also a kind of decision, but it's not much deliberation in there. They agree and they do what they asked for. What we did, we did just compare this default condition of experiments with assigned tasks with a condition where people at least believe that they could choose their task. And the idea is when people can choose a task, effective influences on action here in our talk today, effort mobilization should be minimized, while in assigned tasks, these effective influences should be pretty visible. Um, the experimental paradigm. <clears throat> so um, as usual in our lab, which is specialized in cardiovascular psychophysiology, our dependent rival are measures of effort in the cardiovascular system. And based on uh, very, very important and famous research by Paul Aubrist, and elaborations by Rex Wright. We are especially focusing on cardiac pre-ejection period. For those who don't know what that is, I will explain that a little bit in a second. Uh, the basic idea is that especially beta adrenergic sympathetic uh, influences on the heart are reliable and uh, valid measures of effort, which makes perfect sense because effort is defined as the mobilization of resources and the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for activation. So it makes perfect sense to find a reliable indicator of effort in the cardiovascular system with measures which are systemically influenced by beta adrenergic sympathetic impact. The general procedure, um, people come to the lab and we start with a habituation period. They watch a boring movie for 10 minutes to assess cardiovascular baseline values. Then we have our choice manipulation. Half the participants work in an assigned task condition. So they are simply told uh, what comes next and what they should do. And normally, as usual, they accept and they do it. In the chosen task condition, um, we have uh, made participants believe that they can decide if they want to work on this type of task or that type of task. You will see that in the details that will follow, actually everybody worked on the same task, but 
in the chosen task condition, people had to deliberate and had at least the illusion or the experience of making a choice, while in the assigned task conditions, they had not. And uh, after that, everybody actually works on the same task. We simply assign the task that was ostensibly chosen in the chosen task condition to the next participants in the assigned task condition in the yoke design. Everybody works on the same cognitive task. And during the task, we present happy and sad background music that has shown its uh, effectiveness on uh, inducing happy or sad moods in our past research. The task goes five minutes. And what we expect in general is that the music has an effect on effort mobilization in terms of cardiovascular reactivity when the task is assigned, but that these effects should be minimized when the same task is believed to have been chosen. Um, Prediction period, our primary measure of effort, most of you will know that, those who do not, so it's a uh, measure in which you uh, determine a time interval which takes at baseline in young, healthy adults about 100 milliseconds. And you do that while, uh, with, with measures of ECG and the change of impedance after the uh, heart has uh, pumped blood following a heartbeat into the vasculature which makes the impedance, the electrical resistance in the body around uh, the heart change. And uh, what you do is you determine the moment with the ECG, our onset, or the Q point, if you have a reliable uh, uh, ECG, um, where the electrical stimulation of the muscle fibers in the left ventriculum starts and you measure with the so-called B point in the impedance signal, the moment where the aortic valve opens and lets the blood out into the vasculature. So it's a time interval between starting to contract and letting the blood out. As I said, it's a time measure. It takes around 100 milliseconds. Uh, if you can exclude some little artifacts which are possible, this is a measure which is purely determined by beta adrenergic sympathetic impact and therefore according to a lot of authors uh, seen as a very reliable sensible and valid measure of resource mobilization and that is as effort so we have seen now how we measure effort how can we predict in general effort i've talked a little bit about mood effects but the basic logic behind what we think why moods have these effects is motivation intensity theory in motivation intensity theory by brain the idea is that resource uh, mobilization is based on a resource conservation principle. This means that people do the necessary, but not more. To prevent the misunderstanding, this does not mean that the theory predicts people are lazy and want to minimize effort. People are absolutely okay with mobilizing high amounts of effort if this amount is justified. And if it's possible, to mobilize this. Otherwise, that would be a violation of the principle of resource conservation. So the theory elaborates this principle of resource conservation and uh, the necessary is a critical variable, which is subjective plus difficulty. And the theory predicts that effort rises with subjective difficulty up to the point where more effort than justified would have to be mobilized. If this is not the case, that effort is further mobilized, people disengage, or if it's impossible because difficulty is absolutely uh, extreme or experienced as extreme and uh, therefore success is subjectively not possible. At both points, people should disengage immediately because otherwise they would violate the principle of resource conservation. So what people avoid is not effort. What people avoid is simply wasting effort or mobilizing more effort than necessary and justified. Um, this basic theory is very precise, nice, has been uh, the basis of, I don't know how many publications now, I think we are 130 or so, we counted in the last review. And uh, well, it's a very nice theory because it's very precise, as I said, reliable and easy to falsify. There are not many degrees of freedom for research to say, well, okay, it should be other way around. However, if we talk about effective influences, the theory is silent about that. So what we did, years ago is integrating the mood behavior model with the principles of motivation intensity theory. And uh, that leads to the following prediction about mood effects on effort on low or high or extremely high also objective plus difficulty levels. The idea is, as I said in the beginning, that a happy mood led the same task 
appear relatively easy, while a sad mood lets the same task people have to work on appear relatively difficult. As a result, when difficulty is low, people in a sad mood should mobilize more efforts than people in a happy mood, because for them, task demand is higher, but for both, it's still feasible. However, when the task is objectively difficult, the pattern of the mood effect should turn around, because here people in a happy mood should experience the subjective demand is high, but still feasible, because the happy mood works like a buffer. But people in a sad mood, they should disengage here, because they have the objectively high task demand, and subjectively they add the mood effect and the mood congruency effect to that. And that leads to very, very high task demand, which should appear at an objectively really hard level as over challenging. And according to the principles of motivation intensity theory, this should lead immediately to disengagement. So for easy tasks, sad mood should lead to more efforts than a happy mood for a very hard task, which is still feasible. For some people, it should turn around. And for an extremely task, which is not possible for anybody, mood should have no effect because there are things that have for everybody very clear that mobilizing effort would not make sense. Um, the important point here is, however, this applies to assigned tasks, and it was very well demonstrated that it works in the experiments where people always worked on assigned tasks, which is the normal default condition in psychology experiment. But our hypothesis here is now that people who work on the same task as those in the assigned condition have the idea that they have chosen their task should not show these mood effects because they should immunize, they should show the shielding effect. First experiment focused on an easy task. We had 88 participants in a two by two design. Half the participants worked on the assigned task. The other half believed to uh, choose a task. All that work I will explain in a second. And uh, while they worked on the task, which was the same for everybody, half the participants listened to happy background music and the other half to sad background music. The task was a short memory task we borrowed from Bielefeld. And um, what we did is in the task choice condition, participants had to deliberate for one minute if they want to work in the following part of the experiment on a memory task or an attention task. They had one minute with the two options, memory task, attention task, and had to wait one minute. After one minute, they were asked, okay, which task do you want to work on? They indicated their choice and they were asked to confirm it to make sure that they really will work on what they have chosen. In the uh, assigned task condition, people just simply waited one minute. They had a small break of one minute until the task began. All participants worked on the same task. It was a yoke design in the sense that if somebody in the choice condition said, I want to work on a memory uh, uh, task, we let people believe in the assigned task condition, now we will work on a memory task. If somebody in the chosen task condition believed, I want, uh, said, I want to work on an attention task, we said to the participant who followed in the assigned task condition, okay, you will work on an attention task. It's the same task for everybody. The structure of the task was like this, not complex, and also from the difficulty, not, not really challenging. So we can really have a very high rate of successful responses without problems. Uh, the task is uh, made up like this. So you get a string of numbers. This string of numbers appears for three seconds. Then there is a string of letters, which is a distractor for two seconds. And then there is another string of numbers. And the task of the participant is to say if the second string is identical to the first string, yes or no. And this task, well, it has an attention component. You have to be attentive to the screen. It has a memory component. Nobody doubted that uh, it is really an attention or memory task. Despite the fact, uh, well, we manipulated everything. It was just an illusion that those in the choose, uh, choice condition could really choose. The task took five minutes and half the participants listened while they were working on the task to happy music, Vivaldi's Quattro Stagioni, while the other half listened to sad music, Simas the Coup, it's a film uh, music piece, which is really depressing. Both are classical types of music, so this is identical. There are not so many differences about this. And uh, well, let's see the results. We have here the effects on pre-ejection period. These are reactivity scores with uh, respect to baseline. So the change of pre-ejection period during the task compared to baseline. And uh, if numbers are negative, that means that pre-ejection period became shorter. It's clear. 
And uh, the uh, reason why that's effort is the shorter pre ejection period is, the stronger is cardiac contractility. So the shorter the pre ejection period, the higher is effort. And we see that in the assigned task condition, people in the set mood condition, they mobilized higher effort, strong effect on pre ejection period, while those who listened to the happy music showed a significantly weaker effect. This replicates what we have found previously uh, in other studies in the assigned task condition. Okay, now the big question, what's going on in the chosen task condition? Well, you find that both conditions only mobilized a moderate level of effort and that the music had no effect, which was what was intended. If you had, um, if you have listened attentively, you may ask yourself now, okay, but why is there's low effort in the chosen task condition? He said at the beginning, uh, choice should increase commitment. That means, well, succeeding should be important and therefore everybody should mobilize high effort. No, remember, this is an objectively easy task. And if the task is easy and if there is no mood effect, it's easy for everybody and there should be no difference in difficulty, everybody, experience a low difficulty level. And even if a lot of justified effort is here because of the choice, it does not mean that people mobilize this because it's not necessary. It is perfectly corresponding to the principles of motivation intensity theory. Okay, but to see if there's really an effect on the justification of effort by choice and to see if this applies also in different task contexts. We run another study with a difficult task. Now you remember when task difficulty is high, the mood effect in the assigned task condition should turn around and people in a happy mood, they should mobilize more effort than people in a sad mood or people who are exposed to happy music should mobilize more effort than people who are exposed to sad music. Again, a two by two design, half could choose, half was in the assigned task condition, one half worked on the task while exposed to happy music, the other while well, to sad music, the music was the same. But now we get a challenging memory task. And in this chattering memory task, which is also connected with some attention processes, people had to choose again in the choice condition, well, I want to work on a memory task or an attention task, but the task was again the same for everybody, but it was structured like this. So for five minutes in 39 trials, there were a series of uh, four letters appearing on the screen, one after the other, including 19 vowels. And participants had the task to count all the walls and to note them down in the correct order afterwards. This is challenging, but given that there is no feedback and given that you have a hard time to know where you are, you're just always updating, updating, updating the list in your mind. Um, there is no disengagement. So it's not extremely difficult. Or at least people don't experience it like this. It's a challenging task. Okay, um, let's see, pre-ejection period. As expected in the assigned task condition, the mood effect is turned around, but still present. Here now happy music leads to stronger pre-ejection period, higher effort than sad music, which is predicted according to the mood behavior model and which was found in a number of previous studies. What's happening in the chosen task condition? Well, there is no mood effect. There is a shielding effect as expected and both groups exposed to happy or sad music now mobilize relatively high effort, which is predicted according to the principles of motivation intensity theory because a lot of effort is justified. And here also necessary because difficulty is high for everybody, but not biased further by mood. So again, some evidence that effective influences on effort mobilization seem to be limited to the condition that people work on assigned tasks, probably because there is less commitment and there is little shielding against effective influences compared to conditions where people can choose. In this study, we had additional effects on heart rate and systolic blood pressure, which perfectly correspond to the PEP pattern. Here, it's of course inverse because here higher effort should be indicated by increased heart rate and increased blood pressure. And you see the pattern corresponds perfectly to the effect on pre-ejection period. So what does this mean? The conclusions or the news, as predicted, 
task choice leads to shielding against effective influences on effort-related cardiovascular response. This is a new finding, and this can reconcile two parts of the literature which were pretty contradicting. The effect literature and the uh, volition literature, they just uh, didn't fit together at this point. So one camp said, okay, people become determined when they accept a challenge, they will go and do the necessary and they will be uh, immunized against uh, the incidental effective influences, while the effect behavior literature has demonstrated, and not only we, a lot of other people too, effects of systematic influences of effect on volition. I think choice and working on the science task is a very strong moderator that can reconcile these effects. The effective influences seem indeed to be reserved for assigned tasks. And uh, the PEP responses in the chosen task conditions support the idea that task choice increases the importance of success. That's an indicator of commitment, justification of high effort, because you've seen in study two difficult task, everybody mobilized high effort in the chosen task condition. And on a larger perspective, our findings add to the other demonstrations and there are a lot of the benefits of choice. There are review papers by Liotti and Patel. And uh, we can also reconcile uh, the effect uh, literature with the uh, humanistic uh, psychology in terms of self-determination theory, which has repeatedly shown that the experience of autonomy and making a choice is a nice occasion to experience autonomy has beneficial effects on motivation and action. So in brief, effective influences on effort mobilization are pretty evident when people work on the sign tasks, but if they can choose, these effective influences can be controlled and maybe wiped out. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Malinsky, and today I'll be talking about work I've done with my colleague Rex Wright concerning self-control. Throughout today's presentation, self-control will be defined as the active resistance against an urge. Self-control is a phenomenon we're all very familiar with, especially recently with the outbreak of the coronavirus. Many of us had to actively resist against the urge to go see friends, families, and loved ones, attend social gathering, and do many of other life's normal activities to instead stay home, socially isolate, and help prevent the spread of the virus. Self-control is also a phenomenon that's very important for goal striving. Many of us have had to enact self-control to fight off urges when trying to reach our long-term goals. Take, for example, the urge to, the goal to have a healthier weight one might have to fight off the urge to eat unhealthier options in lieu of more healthy options to reach this long-term goal. Self-control is also very important for our career in academia, as many times the work doesn't stop when we leave the office. Once we arrive home, many of us have to fight off those short-term leisure urges, like watching TV or reading a book, to instead continue working on our long-term academic goals by writing papers, making presentations, or working on research. All the examples that I've gone over here are actually a specific subtype of self-control known as behavioral restraint or active resistance against an urge to act. While this phenomenon is very common to all our lives and has been re researched by psychologists for many years, there is actually not one agreed upon theory to support this entire phenomenon. The most popular theory out there was put out by Roy Baumeister called the limited resource model. In the limited resource model, Baumeister argued that self-control functions like a muscle, drawing on a specific but limited resource that's needed to perform self-control. In the short term, use of this research will deplete it, leaving one unable to perform subsequent self-control tasks as the resources required to perform self-control. In the long term, after rest, this resource will replenish and allow one to perform more tasks of self-control and repeatedly depleting the self-control resource will lead to a bigger reserve of this resource, allowing for more self-control in the future before depletion occurs. While this theory is easily understood and became widely popular because of this ease, its lack of nuance has led to many concerns coming out in recent years about it, with many questioning the core assumptions of that short-term depletion effect. While we could talk about many concerns throughout today's talk, we will focus on three specific categories that are most relevant to the research I'll present here. First is perceptual concerns. These are studies which are able to show that not actual resource depletion can lead to the short-term depletion effect. 
These studies highlight that just making someone perceive that they are depleted can cause someone to then fail a subsequent self-control task. And this calls into the question if it's actual resource availability that's at the heart of the limited resource model or just the perception of resource availability that's leading to the subsequent self-control failure. The second group of, of concerns is about incentives. This group of researchers were able to show that providing an incentive during that subsequent control task could get rid of that short-term depletion effect. And for example, if you have a group of people who are depleted, thus completely out of their resources, and then they do a subsequent self-control task, which you offer them money to complete the task, all of a sudden they are able to accomplish the subsequent self-control task. This is at odds with the limited resource model, since in the limited resource model, this resource is required to perform the subsequent self-control task. So there should be no reason that increasing incentive value of that subsequent task would allow someone to complete it if the resources were truly required to accomplish self-control. Finally, there has been a large amount of researchers who have been unable to replicate the short-term depletion effect of the limited resource model. These failures of replications have led to many meta-analyses being created, with some saying that once you correct for small sample size and uh, publication bias, that all of a sudden the effect of the short-term depletion goes away. And in other cases say that the long-term training effect of the model is very small once correcting for these biases. This has led many to question if the limited resource model is needed at all, and many others urging just to get rid of it and start from scratch with a brand new model. Us here think that the resource model is still useful and we do not need to get rid of it completely, but instead increase the nuance of the model, add to the effect that fatigue has on performance. What we argue here is that fatigue's effect on restraint is not single faceted. It does not always lead to failure. Instead, we believe that fatigue is a multifaceted construct that can affect restraint performance depending on a variety of other variables during that subsequent follow-up restraint task. Depending on these other variables, you could see the failure that Baumeister predicted. You could see fatigued people perform worse on the subsequent control task than their non-fatigued counterparts. You could also see though, that fatigued individuals succeed where normally they would succeed on the test, but even with fatigue, they also still succeed. And then finally, you can have fatigue just lead people to confirm their inclinations not to restrain. These people would have never restrained even if they were not depleted, but depletion is just leading them to confirm their inclination to not restrain. Uh, throughout this paper, I will be calling depletion fatigue from now on as we see them as the same type of construct. Uh, we are able to make this assumption concerning the multifaceted nature of fatigue by borrowing on research that's popular in the motivational realm, known as the integrative analysis. It was theorized by Wright in 1996 and combines Brehm's motivational intensity theory with Ober's active coping hypothesis. Ober's active coping hypothesis simply states that beta energetic influences on the hardened vasculature will vary with effort in response to a performance challenge. These beta-energic influences are primarily seen through myocardial contractility or how forcefully the heart contracts. So simply when the body is presented with a performance challenge, it knows that it needs resources to accomplish these challenges and it uses beta-energic influences to make the heart contract more forcefully and mobilize more resources to meet the demands of some challenge. We are able to measure changes in myocardial contractility through two distinct measures. One being pre-ejection period. This is the time interval from the electrical stimulation of the left ventricle to the opening of the aortic valve. This time period is able to tell us when the heart is first told to start to close to the point when the aortic valve opens up, allowing us to measure how long it took for the heart to close. The quicker the heart closes, the more forcefully it did, and thus the more blood it's pushing out into the vasculature. This is the gold standard for measuring myocardial contractility because it's measured directly on the heart and thus not influenced by vasculature space. The second best measure is systolic blood pressure, the peak pressure following a heart closure. This is also a good measure of myocardial contractility because the more forcefully the heart contracts, the more blood it will push out into the vasculature, thus making that higher peak pressure bigger. However, because it must be measured in the vasculature, it is then also influenced by vasculature space, making it the second best measure, but is usually seen in, in comparison to pre-ejection period in all studies. Brehm's motivational intensity theory uh, goes against the common notion 
that success importance predicts effort. It says that this primary function of effort is to sustain behavior, not to gain positive rewards and avoid negative outcomes. Since the primary function of effort is sustained behavior, effort then must be determined directly by task difficulty, providing us the graph you see here. As task difficulty increases, so does effort. However, success importance is not completely useless to the model. Instead, what success importance does is it moderates this relationship between task difficulty and effort, determining when tasks become no longer worthwhile. Motivational intensity theory is built off of the law of conservation of resources. It says humans want to avoid wasting resources at all points. Because of this, if a task, if the resources required to sustain the behavior are outweighing the, things, the positive things one would gain or the negative things one would avoid, then people will disengage from the task. They'll no longer try. They'll say, my resources are worth more to me than whatever outcomes I'll get from this task. Thus, I don't wanna sustain the behavior. I'll disengage, I'll not try, and I'll put forth low effort. So this provides us the resulting graph you see here, where as task difficulty increases, effort will increase to a point determined by your potential motivation or your success importance. Once you have a task difficulty that requires effort above that success importance mark, requiring one to mobilize more resources than they gain or then they, they see more valuable than the positive or negative things they avoid, then they'll disengage. They'll no longer try, they'll, res they'll keep their resources, they'll save those, and then they will disengage from the task. We see fatigue as an ability influence on this model. Simply, fatigue performers see all tasks as more difficult and their ability on those tasks is lessened. This leads with it some interesting outcomes, such that if both fatigue and rested performers see a task as worthwhile given their success importance level, the fatigue performers will always put forth more effort on those tasks because they see those tasks as more difficult. You can see an example of this at the low difficulty arrow on the graph, where in which both fatigued and rested see this low difficulty task as possible and worthwhile, but fatigued performers are putting forth more effort to complete them. In this case, we would not expect a performance different as both groups are trying, but fatigued people would have to put forth more effort and thus have a higher effort leg cardiovascular response to complete the same task as their rested performers. Going forward, because fatigued people see all tasks as more difficult, this will lead them to hit their upper limit of potential motivation quicker, thus leading to disengagement on tasks of lower difficulty than their rested counterparts. You can see this at the moderate difficulty level in which you see rested performers still engaging at the task, putting forth a lot of effort. However, their fatigue counterparts have disengaged because they see the amount of resources needed to complete this moderately difficult task is excessive compared to their success importance. Thus, they choose to disengage and conserve the resources. Finally, once both rested and fatigued performers see the task is not worthwhile, as you can see in this high difficulty task, both will disengage, leading to both, perform or both rested and fatigued performers not trying and performing poorly on the task. When extending this theory to behavioral restraint is built on two assumptions. First is that behavioral restraint involves expending oneself to meet a performance challenge. Second is one can behaviorally restrain in different measures. All of these two assumptions, the transition of the model that we just talked about to the behavioral restraint realm is rather easy. It just involves determining what determines task difficulty, effort, and importance in a behavioral restraint context. For our, our conclusions came that task difficulty in a behavioral restraint context is determined by the magnitude of the urge one must resist. Thus, along the x-axis, you can see we replace task difficulty with urge magnitude, with larger urges being harder to resist than smaller urges. Along the y-axis, we have replaced effort with restraint intensity, because this says how hard someone is trying to restrain. Now, restraint intensity should be correlated highly with effort, which should also be predictive of cardiovascular responses leading to myocardial contractility. Finally, the importance level is determined by all outcomes that are important for the behavioral restraint. So all the positive things one could gain for behaviorally restraining, as well as all the negative things they can avoid from behavioral restraint will determine that upper limit of potential motivation and thus determine when tasks are considered worthwhile or not. Once you have created this graph, you can see the multifaceted nature of fatigue that we talked about earlier. When you have this interweaving of the fatigue level along with the urge magnitude level and the importance, you can start making precise predictions about what outcome to predict. 
As you can see from my success arrow, this is a task that urge magnitude is small enough where both fatigued and rested performers see the task as worthwhile and possible. If you gave someone an urge of this magnitude, you would not support the limited resource model's predictions. You would instead say both fatigued and rested performers are performing to the same level, and thus it would go against the limited resource model. In actuality, there is a difference amongst these performers, but it's only able to be seen in effort-related cardiovascular response, not in performance. And that's where the nuance comes in of this added model. In this idea, we can see that while fatigued performers are performing to the same level as their rested counterparts, they must try much harder to do so. Going forward, when we get to this window here that we like to call the sweet spot, this is actually where the limited resource model will work. This is where their predictions are correct. It's in this window where you see the failure arrow that rested performers see the task as worthwhile and possible given their level of importance, but fatigued performers do not. They have chosen disengage because they believe the amount of resources needed to complete a task with this big of an urge is too high. It costs too many resources and their outcomes for completing this behavior restraint task do not make the resources required worthwhile. Thus, they've disengaged, saving their resources and putting forth low effort. When a task of this urge magnitude is given, one can predict that rest performers will perform better than their fatigue counterparts and will also put forth more effort when doing so, because the fatigue people are simply not trying at this point. Finally, going all the way down to very, very high urge magnitudes, you can see where we have the prediction just where fatigue will just confirm one's inclination to not restrain. A task of this large difficulty would have led rested performers to disengage already. If no one was fatigued in this condition, everyone would have disengaged because the task requires so many resources that the importance level is not enough to account for them. So being fatigued did not lead to a differing outcome. Instead, if you ran this study, you would not support the limited resource model again, because you would say both groups perform the same. However, the reason both groups perform the same is because no one tried at all. And both groups disengaged and performed poorly, but fatigue had no influence on performance and thus the limited resource model would not have been supported. With this increased nuance, we can see why there is such conflicting evidence existing in the literature currently, because the limited resource model's prediction should only work in a very tiny window in this sweet spot where rested performers see a task as worthwhile and possible and fatigue people have chosen to disengage. Any difficulties before this window or after this window are gonna to lead to differing results that would be seen in contrast as failures to replicate of the limited resource model's short-term depletion effect. We've done two studies so far to test this model. In the first one, we wanted to see the ability for effort to predict increase in urge magnitude and for the ability of importance of behavioral restraint to moderate the relationship between urge magnitude and restraint intensity. To do this, we created a video clip restraint test where we presented people a violent video clip from the movie Saving Private Ryan and asked them to resist showing any facial response to the movie. Now the movie's very violent, so it should cause a grotesque reaction and this should urge them to put forth some type of grotesque facial response. Here, asking them not to block the feeling of grotesqueness, but instead block the facial response that that urges them to make. We then manipulated urge magnitude by either including the sound in the video, giving us urge magnitude high difficulty restraint task or not including sound in the video. That's giving us a low urge magnitude uh, restraint task. We then manipulate success importance through either outcome expectancy or through all three of the following. First, we had outcome expectancy either low or high. In the high condition, they had a 19 out of 20 chance to win a movie ticket, where in the low condition, they had a one out of 20 chance. We also included ego involvement, where in the high importance condition, we told them that success on this task was predictable of later life success, and we omitted this information from the low importance condition. And then finally, we used social evaluation, where in the high importance condition, we said that the experimenter would know how well they performed, and in the low importance condition, we said that no one would ever know how well they performed. This uh, condition, or these manipulations resulted in four conditions in the following two graphs that you see here. In the top graph, we have the two conditions, no sound and sound, that had high importance. In these conditions, we predict that both the no sound condition, the low urge magnitude, and the high sound condition, the high urge magnitude, should see the task as worthwhile and possible, and thus try in both cases, and we should see effort, and specifically effort-related cardiovascular response, 
increase going from low to high urge magnitude. On the other hand, in the bottom graph, when importance is low, we predict low effort-related cardiovascular responses for both conditions. In the no sound condition, we predict that they would try. However, the task is easy. It doesn't require much effort, thus they'll put forth the effort that's required to fight that level of urge magnitude. In the sound condition, when the urge magnitude is high, we expect disengagement. Because the importance level is so low, we think that the amount of resources required for that sound on hard urge magnitude condition is too high, leading the participants to deem that task is no longer worthwhile with their low level of importance and thus disengaging and not trying. Uh, results supported this. In this study, we only collected systolic blood pressure but, and did not find the correct pattern, but did find the correct results or did not find the correct directionality, but did find the correct pattern. As you can see here, in both low abogenous conditions, we had low changes in systolic blood pressure. Uh, all of these results are change in systolic blood pressure because we take out any baseline effects that you would see. So this is baseline, or this is the actual task results subtracted from the baseline. So in the low abogenous condition, we had lower change in effort than we did in the high abogenous, or in the high abogenous, high success importance condition because the low abogenous task is easy. So success importance did not matter either way. Both groups tried on the task. They didn't need much effort because it was an easy task. And thus, as you can see, neither of them put forth much effort. Going to the high abogenous condition is really where the interesting part of this comes in, where you see that the low importance condition puts forth the same low amount of effort seen in the low abogenous condition. Like we said, this is because this group has chosen to disengage. They say that the amount of resources required to complete this task is too high. Thus, I'm not gonna try. I'm gonna disengage, conserve my resources, and not waste them for this poor outcome that we've offered. However, in the high evocativeness, high importance condition, you can see that engagement occurred, people tried, and the most effort reactivity was seen in systolic blood pressure. Now, as you can tell, the directionality of these specs are not as we expected, and we highly believe this was because of a very shortened baseline period that we included, which did not allow people to come to complete rest, meaning that these results should not be negative, but instead increase from negative four or somewhere around there. The second task we've completed uh, was completed just recently and it looked at the things missing from the previous Agatrap et al. study. In Molinsky et al., we wanted to see the ability for fatigue and urge magnitude to interact. So in this study, we kept success importance constant and we instead manipulated how fatigued our participants were and the level of urge that they uh, were faced with. This directly tested the limited resource model problem that we were uh, have set out to test from the beginning. Uh, to manipulate fatigue, we use the AX continuous performance task, either set to a very low difficulty for our rested performers or a very high difficulty to create our fatigue group. We then use the exact same video clip task using Agatrip et al., again with no sound and sound to manipulate the urge magnitude levels. In this case, importance was set to a high level, thus they just got an incentive for completing the task. Uh, we it, we improved the Agatrep et al. study in the design from there by one, adding a performance measure, which was not previously available in the Agatrep et al. study. This performance measure allowed us to see the time participants spent with a non-neutral face, allowing us to know how much facial reaction people did. While we also measured the intensity, this did not prove to be important for our outcomes. We also included the gold standard measure of pre-ejection period, which also wasn't present in Agatrep et al. Through the manipulation of our two variables, we got the following graph you can see on the right. In the no sound condition, we expect fatigued performers or rest performers to perform the same, but for the fatigued performers to have to put forth more effort seen here in pre-ejection period than their rested counterparts. If this study was just done, our no sound condition, this would be in stark contrast limited resource model. It would be seen as lack of replication for it. However, with our increased understanding, we now know that this is just because the urge magnitude is not high enough to hit the sweet spot. Thus, when we increase the urge magnitude by putting the sound on on the video, we then are able to replicate the LRM uh, short-term depletion effect. We're able to show that rested performers are gonna perform better than their fatigue counterparts. However, they're gonna also have to try harder because their fatigue counterparts have disengaged, thus they're not trying where the rested performers are. Our results came out strongly in support of our prediction. 
So this is pre-ejection period. Again, this is change from baseline. And since pre-ejection period is a time period, shorter pre-ejection period times mean more effort. In our low evocative condition, you can see that the high fatigue group had to put forth much more effort than their low fatigue counterparts. Both groups see this low evocative task worthwhile if possible, how, and thus the high fatigue group had to put forth more effort because they see all tasks as more difficult. Moving to the high evocative condition, we see the exact opposite results. We instead see that the low fatigue group is trying much harder than their high fatigue counterparts who have disengaged from this high evocative task because it's no longer worthwhile to them with the increased difficulty added from fatigue. Finally, in support of the limited resource model, we also found the performance effect that they would predict, but only in our high evocative condition. So as you can see, in our high evocative condition, we have the limited resource model effect where the fatigue group performed significantly worse than the rested counterparts. The high fatigue group spent a significantly more time with a non-neutral face than the rest of counterparts and than any other group in the entire study because they have chosen to disengage and not try. However, if you instead look at the low evocative condition, you get the exact opposite effect where both groups perform exactly the same to one another, ir irrespective of their fatigue level. As we said, while the high fatigue group is trying harder, they're still trying. Thus, performance should be based much more on their ability than on any kind of fatigue levels or anything along those lines, because both groups are trying and want to complete the task. It's just that the high fatigue group must try harder to do so. Um, so currently, this is all the research we have. We're very excited about what we found, and we will be doing much more research down this path to further support our claims. We have received funding from the German funding agency DFG to test the three-way interaction between fatigue, difficulty, and success importance, as well as the three-way interaction between fatigue perception, difficulty, and success importance, and finally, to do more of a long-term training study to look at that long-term effect of training and have a strength training effect, and then we'll have predictions based on that. I thank you for your time and have a good day.